scriptures from John 17, uh, verses 1 to 11. This is known as the high priestly prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had before the world began. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And now they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Uh, and the priestly prayer goes on, but that's the first 11 verses. Um, Jesus' high priestly prayer, right? Jesus is the high priest. Um, here he prays to the Father on behalf of his disciples. Um, before we look at everything that's being said, I just want to make a few points about the high priestly prayer. Some amazing things about the prayer. Right? He's praying for his disciples. Uh, I want to point out that he's not pointing out their weaknesses or their shortcomings. Right? When he, when he prays to the Father, he's not saying, man, they just don't get it, Dad. <laughs> because they don't, right? He, he, he's talking about stuff and it's just going over their head. He's not, he's not, his prayer is not to criticize them. His prayer is to lift them up. He calls them his own. And, and isn't what that what we all want? To be called his own? For Jesus to stand before the Father and say, they're with me. I, I had a little experience. Uh, years ago, uh, I was the NMI, which is the missions part, I was the vice president of the district. Sharon Harvey, the DS's wife, was the president, and she resigned her position, and so I was automatically put up to the president's position, which I didn't want, but it happened. And then they told me I had to go to the thing called the President's Gathering, was was in Nashville, Tennessee, at the Grand Ole Opry Hotel. We were there for five, six days, and... Uh, meetings and, and, and courses. It was like trying to drink out of a fire hydrant. There was so much information. But the, I didn't know anybody. And I felt so out of place. Uh, we have a little district, right? Our whole district budget for the NMI at that year was like $14,000. And I sat beside this woman who was from Michigan and her budget was $600 under $1 million. We're pretty small in the big scheme of things, right? Anyway, I sat there through the, the first day of business meetings and, and everything, and I was just trying to absorb this. And, 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 and a really neat part of our denomination is the ministry stuff that happens in the mission field. And you get to hear some incredible stories. So I, I sat through that, and that night there was a big gala. And Chandra Pierce, the Christian comedian, was she's an Nazarene. She was the speaker that night. And I uh, didn't know a soul. I had this guy, Don Johnson is his actual name. He's the NMI president out in uh, Vancouver. And we, were, we had a room together. And uh, we were going to this thing. And I, I said, I really, I don't even want to go. I don't know anybody. Uh, I, anyway, our first district superintendent, his name was Roy Fuller. And I'd only met him once. And I was walking down the hall with Don going, oh, let's find a place in the back. And I hear this person shouting, Randy, 
Randy. And I looked around and finally I saw Roy Fuller. Nina Fuller, his wife, was the NMI president for their district. And he came running up to me and treated me like a long lost kid, you know. And uh, his table was right beside the stage. And he was sitting with Nina Gunter, who ended up being a general superintendent. This is just before she got elected. Uh, Rue Baker, who was, she was the head of NMI worldwide. And Talmadge Johnson, who was a general superintendent. And so he says, what are you, where are you sitting? And I said, oh, we're going to find a seat in the back. Nonsense. <laughs> Brings me up to the table and he says to Brubaker, would you mind finding another seat? He's with me. <laughs> and I looked at her and went, <laughs> and she said, no, I will. She said, enjoy the show. And, and she graciously, that's, that's what I want to happen when I get to heaven. For Jesus to say, it's okay, come with me. He's with me. Right? So that, that's what he's saying in his prayer. He calls them his own. He speaks about how they are part of God's purpose in association with himself. It's like, these are, these are my guys. These are the guys that are doing what I've asked them to do. He never asks for worldly blessings in his prayer for them. He doesn't say, God, make them rich. He doesn't say, you know, always provide for them. Make sure they have enough clothing. Make sure they have enough food. Make sure that he, he prays. He can never ask for honor or fame or influence. He prays that God will protect them from the evil and separate them from the world and bring them safely to heaven. That's his prayer. They're, they're doing what... I did what you sent me to do. They're doing what I'm asking them to do and they will continue to do it. And so, bring them home. Just bring them home. Uh, so in verse 1 it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. The time had finally come. If, if, you, if you read the, through the Gospels, you'll, you'll see instances where people tried to push Jesus into action. Tried to make him the king. Tried to do things. And he would say, my time has not come. Here he's saying the time has come. The time is here. So, um, look at how this glorification, will, glor this glorification will come through the cross. What a weird instrument to do this. And he's saying, I'm ready. Imagine. I'm ready. I, I, I have been a fireman now for... I'm in my 26th year. Or no, I just completed my 26th year. I'm in my 27th year. And um, <coughs> people say, oh, yeah, I'm a fireman. And, you know, someone in the church said, you know, I just went into a burning building and, and, and started to compare it to Jesus' sacrifice. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Back off a little bit. When I go into a building after someone, I have... Full expectation of coming back ever. Right? He knows he's not coming out of this one alive. And he's saying, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> the time has come. The hour has come to glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. The time had finally come. Uh, it'll come through the cross. Every prophecy had to be fulfilled. Every healing had to be done. Every lesson had to be taught. And now the time has come. It's very interesting. And then verse 2 it says, Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. He's saying because of the work that he would complete on the cross, God was going to give him authority over the world. He will redeem all who believe in him. That's just amazing. He said they're given to him by the Father. They were also different. They all had flaws. And I wonder if in them we can still find ourselves. 
But all authority would be given to him. That's why Jesus, just before the ascension in Matthew 28 says, And Jesus came to them and said, What? All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I am with you always to the very end of the age. He, he, he's prophesying about himself. I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to finish this. And when I finish it, all authority will be given to me. And with that authority, I will bring them home. I will bring them back into that relationship that we had in the garden. Verse 3, it says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What a, what a wonderfully simple description of eternal life. Knowing God. Right? And we sing that song, Knowing You, Jesus. There is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. Knowing, you know, you know I, I, when I think of the, the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man's in hell, right in that story, and Lazarus is in heaven being attended, and this is my vision of hell being able to see heaven and I can't get there because there is a great chasm fixed between the two because it, I don't think and I, I should have done the work but I, I didn't get time I wanted to do this but I forgot about it I don't think they mean knowing as in well I know I know yeah I know I, know. I think it's knowing knowing to be in relationship with God so uh, and this is eternal life is that they know you the only true God just like God selected the disciples God sent Jesus right this is all God ordained it's part of his plan but do they know him not know about him but know him personally that, that is a big step for people. People start coming to church and just kind of show up and, and all of a sudden they're here and they, they start coming and, and they develop this hunger to know about God. And, and that's, that's great. I think that's the Holy Spirit part of Nazarene, Provenient Grace, to start knowing about God, to start reading my Bible. But then there's that point where it's okay to keep trying to know more about God but I love to see them when they take that step into knowing God. To, to move away from the academic aspect and go into the personal and emotional aspect of it. It's like I know them. That, that's why I say, that's why I answer the way I answer when people come up to me and they look at my life and they look at where I came from and where I am now and they say, how do you know you're saved? And it's like, because I was there when it happened. And I know them. I know them. And I know he had bigger plans for me. Because through this, to know him personally, it's because through this personal relationship, we find our salvation. You can read your Bible hours every day, every day, every day, every day of your life. You can come to church every Sunday. You can do it Every time the doors are open, you can be there. You can go to every Bible study, watch every video series. You can have your, you put your radio in the car in a Christian program and pull the knob off and throw it in the back seat, and that's all you ever listen to. And if you never come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to get in. Amen. Just that simple. Nobody ever told you that? Suck it up. I just did. <laughs> that's the reality of it. You can read it all you want. But if you're not part of the story, you're not part of the story. Verse 4 says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus is not trapped in some time restriction, but speaks of the future as if it's already happened. The trial, the cross, the resurrection, the victory. 
To Jesus, it's already happened. The victory brings salvation to mankind. And our praises bring glory to God. He has brought and he has bought salvation for men. Salvation for sinners. And, and it's only through that, it's only through that that he can hang on the cross and say, it's finished. Because that's why he came, right? I have come to save the sinners. And, and Pierre and I had a conversation this morning in, in my office, talking about grace and, and repentance. And and some people say, well, you know, repentance is, repentance is works or something. If there's no repentance, there's no need for a Savior. If you think you're sinless, you're sinning in that statement. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and you say that to someone and they, they look at you kind of strange, but when you realize, they realize you're including yourself in that and go, yeah, I have my, I have my own issues. And I've had many, many more throughout my life. The victory brings salvation to mankind and our praise bring glory to God. It is finished. It is finished. Verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Before the world began, Jesus was in heaven where he was glorified with and as God. But when he came to earth as a man, his glory was veiled to most people. And we actually sang that, you veiled your glory. John 1, verses 1 to 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There's a salvation story right there. The world has not overcome it. Jesus is talking about being restored to his former position and standing. Really, he's saying, I'm coming home. And, and, I'm, and I'm taking the road you told me to take. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of this world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. When he says name here, he means the person. He's saying, I showed them you. I came here and I showed them you. What I did was to show them you. They, they need to know you. He has revealed God's true nature to them by how he lived. We, we, we tend to think, especially in the evangelical churches, that to witness to people, you need to go out and smack them over the head with the Bible. Beat them into submission. Point out everything they're doing wrong in their life. I mean, how many of us have done that? It's like, you know, you shouldn't do that. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't do that. Okay. How many of us have thought that? Right? But that's not what Jesus did. He revealed God's true nature, nature to them by how he lived. You want to be a witness? Live your faith. No matter what they're doing, because I'm telling you, as a pastor, it's very discouraging. It's very discouraging because when our kids get into trouble, parents don't tend to stand strong in their faith. They fall apart just like the kids. And they say, why could God let this happen to my kids? Or why did God do that to my kids? God didn't do it. This world is broken. And man is making choices every day. Don't blame God for man's poor choices. We are given free will. And we rarely use it properly. 
uh, as a world in general. You know, people were talking to me this morning about the news, and I, and I don't watch the news because of that. Because people make poor choices every day, and it breaks my heart to read about it. I also find it interesting that he says, out of the world. They were given to him because they belonged to God. They belong to God. Verse uh, John 14, verse 15. He says, uh, oh, because he says, yours they were and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. They proved their love for him by obeying God's word. And understanding, and, and, and listen, it had to be hard. It had to be had to be tough to swallow some of the things that Jesus was saying to them. Because, I mean, they, they, they were all Jewish. They followed the Jewish custom. They had been taught stuff their whole lives. And to finally see that, oh, that's not really... You know, go, go, to the, go to the scripture where it's, Jesus is talking to me. He says, you have heard this, but I'm saying that. You have heard this, but I'm, and that's what he's doing. You have heard it said, love your friends and pray for your enemies. Uh, hate your enemies. And I say, love your enemies. Pray for them. When Jesus says, if you hate someone, you've already murdered them in your heart. When someone slaps you in the face, turn them the other cheek. When someone asks for your shirt, give them your jacket too. When someone says, walk with me for a mile, walk with him for two. When someone's hungry, give him something to eat. When someone's thirsty, give him something to drink. When someone's lonely and in prison, go visit them. When someone's naked, give them some clothes. What does the world say? Look out for number one. Take care of yourself. Scrape them off. Walk away. You're worth it. You deserve it. It's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. To listen to what Jesus says. But they proved it. By obeying God's word. He doesn't talk about any of their shortcomings or failures. He credits them because of their obedience. Verse 7 and 8. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. You see, they understood that the Father had sent him. I don't think they understood what all that meant. They had no idea what was coming down the road. Right? This is, this is John 17. The heading is John 18. It says, Betrayal and arrest of Jesus. It's coming here, right? And they have no idea. But they did understand that God sent them. Jesus said, well, will you fall away too? And, 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 and they said, well, where would we go? You have the words that bring life. Where would we go? They saw miracles he had performed and understood that only the power of God could do such things. The man that was 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 blind from birth, and Jesus heals him, and they start questioning him. We talked about this in a sermon uh, a month or so ago, and they're like, "Well, this guy is from Satan." And even the man says, "Oh, I don't think the devil can do that." He has to be from God. They saw that Jesus didn't come in his own mission, but was following God's will. And he says that. Jesus says, I can do nothing outside my Father's will. I only speak the words my Father gives me. The actions I do are not my own, but those of him who sent me. He repeats it over and over and over in different ways. 
When Peter was asked, who do you say I am? Peter pukes out this answer. You are the son of God. And had no idea what he was saying. He really didn't. Not until the Holy Spirit comes and fills him. Because that's the promise, right? When the helper comes, he's going to drive it home. When the helper comes, you're going to get it. You're going to see it. You're going to understand it. Just bear with me a little while. Because how could Peter understand it and then deny him three times? And Peter uh, really understood Son of God, really understood Messiah, really understood Savior, really understood God in the flesh, really understood part of the three persons of the triune God. If he really understood that, he would stand before them and say, yeah, he's the Son of God. Yeah, I'm with him, buddy. And you can take this light because it doesn't matter. He's got my soul in his hip pocket. But he says it. And I think he wants to understand it. I think he really, really wants to, but he doesn't get it yet. Verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now, this is a specific prayer for his followers. For the 11. And he makes that clear. This doesn't mean that he never prays for the world. On the cross, he prayed that God would forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. In this case, he is representing believers before the throne of God. Verse 10, all mine are yours and all yours are mine and I am glorified in them. You see, the perfect union between the Father and the Son. Nobody but the true Son could say to God that all yours are mine. Just like the praises of believers give glory to God because Jesus is equal with God and also glorified through the praises of his people. And, and, and you know what? Maybe their lives work because of all the criticism that we have for the disciples in that time period. Look at who they became. Think of what you could become with the Holy Spirit living in you. With God guiding and directing your life. The places that you could go. Eleven men would change our world. Eleven men would change our world. Eleven uneducated, untrained men. There used to be a song that, I can't remember his name, he used to say it. I listened to it because he played the blues harp and he, and he said, I've, I've never been to seminary, but I've been to Calvary. And, and that's what those guys had. They've been to Calvary. They'd seen the risen Savior. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they glorified Jesus in everything they did. You know, and, and there's there's little incidents, incidences that happen in the Bible that we read about. Incredible things when they're when they're arrested. Arrested for preaching about Jesus and they're put in prison. They don't say, Oh God, get us out of here. He said, God, make us bolder. What could we do with the Holy Spirit living in us? <laughs> Verse 11. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Here we see the perfect description of Christian character. The perfect union between Father and Son. We see 
that it is God who holds us in his mighty hand and not the other way around. John, one of John's favorite lines is, God created man in his image, and we've been trying to return the favor. And recreate God in our image. If you want to know the difference between a Bible-believing church and a cult, it's pretty simple. A church will tell you to change your life to fit the Bible. A cult will tell you to change the Bible to fit your life. Just that simple. You see, it is God who holds us in his hand. When God the Son leaves, God the Spirit comes and empowers those who are in the world to be able to stand. Then he finishes with the, the, the standard of Christian character. That we would be one just like they are one. And this, this doesn't mean that we're all a bunch of mindless robots walking around, but because we are in unity with the purpose of God. I mentioned this one time before, but we have to come to a point in our life. You ever watch a poker game? And, and they're betting, and they're betting, and they're betting. And then and then somebody gets something like a royal flush. And he takes all his chips, and he goes, I'm all in. What does that say? It, one of two things. It's either a bluff, or he has the unbeatable hand. We have to come to a point in our faith where we go, I'm all in. Because I have the unbeatable hand. I'm standing on the rock. I'm not in the miry clay. And I'm all in. Everything I have, that's, that's entire sanctification. I've never preached really on entire sanctification. But I want to tell you what it is. Entire sanctification is where we are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a moment in time. And we surrender everything we have to God. That's entire sanctification. My life, my future, my family, my finances, my career, my every waking moment I give to you. And then the journey begins. It's a point in time and it's a journey. And we like to think it's a journey and then a point in time. And it's not. It's the other way around. We are sanctified when we surrender everything we have to God entirely and the journey begins does it mean we're perfect? <clears throat> no it means our desire is means our heart is means our surrender is complete it means we realize that every breath you take is a gift from God Jesus' priestly prayer is that we would all be pulling in the same direction. Jesus' priestly prayer is that we would be family. His priestly prayer is that when the world looks at us, it would see something different than what the world is shown in them. Do you realize that this prayer is also for you? I stopped at verse 11. But at verse 20 it says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their work. Mm -hmm. And you, I hope, believe in him. And if you do, it's through their word. Because these 11 boys are going to pick up their own crosses. 
all mine are yours, and all yours are mine. And I am glorified in you. And my prayer for all of us is we would live a life that glorifies our Savior. Let's sing. Dear Lord, I give you my all. And it ain't much. But I know with you, all things are possible. I know that when I surrender my will and allow you to take control of my every action, amazing things happen. Glorify yourself in my life, Lord. Give me the strength and the courage to stand before the world and say, Jesus has my soul in his hip pocket. And I'm good. Bless our families that they would come to know you. Not about you, but know you. Give us the strength and the wisdom to face every day with you by our side. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.